introduction to the meeting as a standard. Um, thank you to all the members of the public councillors and officers who are joining us for today's meeting. Please be aware that the council is video recording this meeting and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to highlight some points of the key points of the meeting format. Uh, please may I ask everyone to have their phones turned off or set to silent. Fire exits are via the doors out of the chambers and down the external fire escape stairs or the via the main entrance that you came uh, that you entered the building through. Um, and in the event of a fire, the lift shouldn't be used. The assembly point is outside the Royal Mail Castle office on West Street. Um, please remain seated un unless you're invited to speak or need to take a comfort break. Toilet facilities are out of the corridor relatively. Um, right, members of the public are invited to participate in the meeting with the key points as follows. Public participation is limited to a maximum of four minutes per person and must be relating to an item of business on the agenda and as chair I will interject if needed to enforce this. Um, when the public participation agenda item is introduced, please raise your hand to show you wish to speak and I'll invite you to speak. Um, if you're comfortable standing, please do so to ensure you can be heard across the room. But thankfully we're in a relatively small room here so that might not be necessary. Um, you do not need to state your name when you start speaking if you don't wish to, um, but we do ask that you clearly state which agenda item you're, you're speaking to tonight. Thank you. Um, I ask that participants looking to leave the meeting wait until the end of an agenda item to limit the distractions for any other participants. And if you are looking to leave early, you'll need to be escorted out by a council officer. Uh, I don't need to do that one, do I? Um, to all present, please remember to show respect to others in the meeting and avoid interrupting where possible to enable others to follow the meeting. If any councillor feels concerned about any aspect of the meeting or discussion, please clearly state point of order. I will then gesture for you to elaborate. If anyone's present is felt to be behaving unacceptably, they can be ejected from the meeting by resolution. And finally, thank you for listening. On behalf of the council, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this final this council meeting. Right, so first item on the agenda tonight are, is apologies for absence. We have no apologies. No, no apologies, thank you very much. And item two is disclosure of interests. Um, do any members of the council have any disclosable pecuniary interests or interests other than pecuniary interests to declare tonight, please? No? Okay, that's no interest, thank you. Moving swiftly on to item three which is the public participation item. Um, so we can now deal with any questions or representations from members of the public in accordance with the relevant legislation and the town council policy. Can I please ask you to indicate if you would like to speak by raising your hand? Okay, excellent. Right, what I'll do is just start from this side of the room and work to that side of the room, if that's okay. So the gentleman in the grey sweatshirt. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I wish to speak in relation to item 5 on the agenda regarding the proposed National Nature Reserve. I can see how the proposed National Nature Reserve could have considerable potential for the town. However, there are aspects of the report that do give rise to concern. I note from the maps that accompany the report in appendices A and B um, that certain areas of Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve are to be excluded, apparently, from the proposed National Nature Reserve. There are extensive areas of the existing reserve. They, as far as I can see, account for over one third of the total area that will be excluded. Now, it seems to me that these areas excluded are, first of all, the area in the west of the reserve, extending southwards from the sixth hole of Seaford Head Golf Course. Secondly, the area enclosed by the concrete circular road to the east of South Hill Barn. <coughs> And thirdly, the area in the east of the reserve, which includes the wooded coppice called Harry's Bush, 
which adjoins the area owned by the National Trust. Now, as far as I can see, two of these areas were later additions to the original Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve, and they were incorporated in 1978 and 1989. Now, the report advises that the land to be included in the proposed National Nature Reserve was identified by Seaford Town Council officers. And I should be grateful if someone could explain why over one third of the existing local nature reserve has been excluded from the proposals. It doesn't appear to make any sense to me. For example, to quote from Appendix A of the report, and it states, connecting the landscape will help nature to thrive and Seaford Head has a key role to play in linking the town with a country park and the rest of Seaford to Beachy Head SSSI. Well, how can this possibly work with a substantial part of the Seaford Head Nature Reserve excluded from the proposed National Nature Reserve. Appendix A also advises that the proposed National Nature Reserve will help deliver National Environmental Improvement Plan targets by improving the condition of SSSIs, improving the health of the chalk aquifer and creating nature-rich land in the wider area. Again, how is this going to be possible with a large part of the um, Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve excluded. Surely the exclusion of this land would devalue the effect of the proposed National Nature Reserve. The report further advises that the status of land within the National Nature Reserve will attract positive attention and funding opportunities. That sounds like good news, but what therefore is the future of land in the current Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve that will be excluded? Will this excluded land be neglected and forgotten about in the future? As we know, we have been left a rich legacy of the existing Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve, which has been assembled by our predecessors over the past 55 years. Surely now is not the time to squander that legacy and dismember effectively our Local Nature Reserve. If you find some merit in joining the National Nature Reserve, then uh, surely I will make a plea to councillors on the committee to make a decision so that all of the land covered by the existing Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve is included in the National Nature Reserve. The last point I'd like to make is that the report seems to be somewhat misleading and ambiguous in that it could be read that the recommendation is that all of the land at Seaford Head designated as an SSSI or a Local Nature Reserve should be included in the proposed Seven Sisters National Nature Reserve but this isn't the case. If you refer, of course, to the maps included in the reports, they again advise that not all of our local nature reserve is going to be included. I therefore suggest that these contradictions should be re resolved before any decision is made by councillors. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for making your points. Um, I can see they've been noted by many in the room, and um, we will be addressing those, I'm sure, as part of agenda item five, so thank you very much. And um, may I ask the, the next gentleman along to please um, make your representation. Um, good evening, thank you. Um, you all have, I hope, put together my jigsaw puzzle which I, of maps and things which I've sent to you. Um, Bill has made the point that these all need to be joined up into something that is cut coherent for everybody before you even start making any decisions about what happens. And thank you, Councillor Meek, for replying to that email. What I have gathered from looking at the backgrounds is that if most or parts of whatever you choose, uh, the LNR becomes part of an NNR, you will then acquire a management committee, which is going to be even bigger and more remote and diverse than the current <coughs> Secret Head Local Nature Reserve Management Committee, which is an outside body. You will have the Forestry England and Natural England on top, as well as Eastbourne Borough Council, and they are all going to squash Seaford. I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. It's our land and we have precious little control over it from the council, as far as I can make out, already. Nobody has talked in the council about Hope Gap for months and months and months and months. And if that goes to some remote 
Management Committee headed in York. I can't wait to make out where the Natural England the Southern headquarters is. It might be in Oxford. I think there's a branch in Ashford. Uh, Ashford. Otherwise, it's all remote control from way above us. And we will lose control over the whole thing. I would urge, actually, that you consider in the light of this also whether or not to bring Secret Head, which is a council asset just like the Crouch, the Salts, the Bartolo Fields, although the ownership of that is in doubt at the moment because the maps, uh, etc., are terribly. Please stick on point. Weird. Um, that all ought to come under control of one Secret Town Council subcommittee or committee. The Golf and Secret Head Review com Committee would be ideal yeah. to oversee the whole thing in house. Thank, Thank you for making a point. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay. next along, please. Uh, item 5 on the agenda. Five also, yeah. yeah um, Visitor numbers to Seaford Head are rising dramatically, especially from tourists from outside the area. Seaford Town Council needs as much help as possible to deal with this influx to maintain the Seaford Head biodiversity and landscape. Joining with the Natural Nature Reserve would help Seaford Town Council to be able to manage the area and gain valuable access to expertise. I fought four areas where management is urgently needed. First of all is controlling the parking vehicle access. I think you should allow minibuses, but not coaches to go up there. It's, it's, just an, it's just ridiculous that coaches are allowed up there. Slow traffic speed going up and down the concrete path and, and possibly create a new footpath alongside the concrete path on the Chington Farm side in order that children can safely walk up there at the moment. Duke of Edinburgh people and people like that are just dodging the cars as they come down. Uh, provide, tourists, provide toilets for tourists. It's not pleasant to see what's going on at the moment. Something has to be done. People are travelling two or three hours to the Seaford Head Park and there's no toilets there. I noticed that Exit Seven Sisters Park has built a huge area of toilets and big areas there, so something must be possible with the right management and funding and grants in place. Thirdly, provide educational facilities at South Barn. This is, a, this is my idea, but I think it would be a sensible thing, especially if Hope Gap could be recreated. And it could be a classroom and display area. You just need a small generator. The water's already already accessed up there to the farm and the cottages. Um, I think that uh, a quiet generator would easily now enable a, 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 a South Barn to function as a classroom area. Fourthly, and in short, access to Hope Gap Steps is reinstated. This is an incredible, valuable resource, and you can't really get access it to it from the Cookmere end with families and stuff, but it's just too uneven to get there. There's all sorts of animals and wildlife in there, seahorses, creations, all sorts of things. So uh, a, a prefabricated staircase similar to one at Purling Gap is perfectly possible. Um, you could obviously go for something a bit more iconic than that one. It wouldn't need to touch the cliff and it could, look, it could cope with the receding cliff line for another hundred years without any problems. Thank you, I pr appreciate your input. I think we're slightly straying off this, but yeah. yes, it's good to talk about the things that are on the periphery yeah. of the area. So thank you very much. And finally. Hi, good you. evening. Item five. As noted in the agenda, the initial inspiration for the NNR came from the need to protect chalk aquifers. This is particularly relevant for STC. As the chalk aquifer provides a drinking water for the town and surrounding areas, but as aquifers are not visible unlike reservoirs, meaning they are often forgotten or misunderstood. So what is an aquifer? It is a water-bearing rock that groundwater can be extracted from. There are about 220 chalk streams in the world, and most of them are located in the south part of England, within our supply area. It is therefore vital that our abstractions from the chalk aquifers are sustained to protect chalk streams for future generations to enjoy. The Seaford and Eastbourne chalk block is already recorded as poor for both quantitative and chemical status as detailed in the Water Resource Management Plan 2020-2080. Strategic Environment Assessment and Environment Report within the above report, tourism is highlighted as driving higher need of water during the summer months as seasons peak coincide with drought. Seaford and the surrounding towns are noted as having the highest seasonal demand. However, walking on the downland is causing erosion, firstly to our footpaths and now other areas. This has an impact on the footpaths and the grass. Another comparison about the visibility that our grass is similar to an Amazon forest as the grass filters the rainwater 
just want to inject, I've lived here now for one year, I live at the bottom of the head, we are, it, we are flooded when it rains, literally flooded. Without grass, water can run off and not be collected and possibly cause further damage. Furthermore, our aquifer is starting to have ingress from salt water. Information from Emma Goddard, South East Waters Environment Manager, in a recent Q&A session, mentioned that tourism and filming could be issues for the area and directed me to raise my concerns at the STC. Climate. At South East Water state that most likely climate change scenario is that there will be less rainwater in the summer and increased rainwater in the winter, together with greater variability of weather events. This could adversely affect, impact, sorry, our current levels of water available in the surface and groundwater. Just to finish on Hope Gap, it's imperative that we have something done because of the emergency services. If they can't get there, they can't help people. So please include them. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your contribution. Thank you. I'm really pleased tonight, and probably should have introduced at the beginning, that uh, sitting in the front row uh, of the audience, we have some officers from Natural England. Yeah. Any other organisations? I'm not 100% sure. Sussex Wildlife. I thought so, yes, sorry, I'm having a Sussex Wildlife Trust as well as Natural England. So when we get to item five, the idea is that we'll suspend standing orders for a little bit um, and if we need to and, and have some questions and answers. But certainly they're going to be given a presentation. So thank you very much to all the members of the public for your um, raising your concerns um, and queries and ideas about <coughs> that particular item. Right, before we get on to that, we will um, just uh, divert on to... Or carry on to point four, which is the climate change update report, um, which has finally been prepared by um, Steve here next to me. So I'm wondering, Steve, would you like to introduce your report and summarise anything particular on it? I think we did have one point, um, oh, sorry, I did have one point um, for an update on the cycle wax. I think that was in there. And then I know we had um, a little bit of feedback on South Advance, whether you'd like to pick up on that. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so obviously uh, councillors hopefully would have seen my report uh, where we touch on urban grass verge cutting, cycle rack installation and South Hill barn proposals. Um, clearly cycle rack installation and South Hill barn proposals were discussed at full council on the 14th of November last week um, and uh, were in public session for, the, for that last week and so any updates are available on the council's YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you want to be saying more than that, Councillor Preston. Um, no, 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 no. Is there any other questions about my report? Yeah, any other questions? Councillor, Councillor Mead. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandra. Um, I, I'm just very concerned that uh, the urban grass verge cutting. We, we don't. I, I don't think we have a kind of program yet. Of, to, of what we're asking our contractor to do. Uh, and I don't know how we're going to get to that before we get to the grass cutting time of next year. And I feel very strongly that this desperately needs to be sorted out with the contractor before we start the year. Because I don't think, uh, last year was, was mayhem because we didn't have a contractor in, in place for a long time. Residents were complaining about the length of the grass in certain places. In my road, I was complaining about it because it's falling into the road, it's seeding everywhere. Uh, and uh, I, I just don't, I, I would like to know how we think we might get to some decision making about instructing our contractors so that they know and we know what's been cut when and how. Okay. Through, the, through the chair, yeah. I can ask Sherry. Sherry, are you okay to come back to Councillor Meek and answer? Mm, that so we um, have just been working with East Sussex to discuss any amendments that they want to make to our contract going forward for next year um, and following those amendments we've been meeting with the contractor to talk about how that will be delivered in 25 and when they will be delivering that. I think we've also made a commitment, Councillor Mick, that we will publicise on the Seaford Town Council's website estimated dates of when cuts should take place and where they should take place so that everyone will be fully sighted on the expectation of when they will take place and we'll know if it's been missed because the deadline date will be there. Mm. Okay. That's Does fair. that answer your query? Could I just come back with another question? Um, if sure. it's on the same uh, I mean, are, are we consulting with local knowledge and local experts about when the best time for cuts is? 
Or are we just taking the SCC's word for it? Well, if I may, I think we've got more cuts than what the SCC were doing anyway. I think we're up to four cuts per year for that because we're not starting the cut and collect probably until the following year. Um, but um, if you'd like to add anything more on that, Sharon, yeah, please do. So we have, there'll be a cut in April before no May May Good. because we already have a contractor in place to be able to pick that up Good. at the beginning of the year. And that's what happened last year because we weren't, we didn't have a contractor in place so we were mowing after no May May. Yeah. That was my main. Excellent. Thank That's you good. very much. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Yes. I, just add, I mean, my, this is before my time, but my understanding is that East Sussex approached the town council and said that they would reduce the amount of cuts to two a year, mm. and if we wanted more than that, we would have to pick them up. So I think what's been agreed is that we would pick up the extra cuts. Last year there were some teething problems, but I believe Sharon and her team on, you know, ready for next year to ensure that it runs more smoothly. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank everyone. That's really useful. Um, Councillor Hanneman, did you have a question? Thank you very much. Yes, just, just for clarity, um, are there, is it, can you confirm it's just the one contractor who does all the seed at all? Do East Sussex still have their own contractors for the key junctions, which will do, which will be up to when they think it should be applicable because that's outside the scope of this particular, what the Town Council own so contractors to do. So is there more than one contractor out and about in, in this so season? So we, we, we've also got the urban grass verges, yeah. which have been taken on, been taken from yeah. East Sussex to see for Town Council now. And we've also got the rural grass verges, some of which are in sort of, you might say semi-urban areas. There's some on Alfriston Road, one half of Bishop mm -hmm. Stone Road and the junction around there and so on. And um, I will just defer probably to Sharon through yeah through the interim, because I know I, I brought this up last year, but I think that we are at liberty to do more cuts to safety for junctions if we need to, but perhaps you can give us some more detail. Yeah, so in the contract review, um, there are some more verges that have been added for us to look at and to cut, and that's the discussion that needs to happen with the contractor. So, so to answer the question, it's still only the one contractor, but you it can be a little bit more, it's a bit more complex than just so they're going to happen in April, going to happen in June, whatever. It's a bit more complex than that, isn't it, in reality? Yeah, so for yeah. Seaford Town Council, we have one contractor mm -hmm. that we work with for the mm -hmm. contract that we deliver for East Sussex. Then there are two other contractors that cut different verges in this district. But excluding Seaford or including Seaford sometimes? Including Seaford sometimes. Which is where it gets confusing sometimes, because people don't always know what contractor is what. So that's why sometimes it can get a bit confused. That's why I asked the question originally, so you can see why. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. It's, it, there is obviously some complexity in the picture there, and I think this year very much, you know, we've we've been sort of migrating towards a smoother process, and I know we've had various queries in from the public, and, and as councillors we've been working with the officers to sort of uh, target snagging list, if you like, uh, about, you know, what's where and, and where there are gaps in the map data and that sort of thing. So it's great that officers are having these conversations ahead of next season. But thank you for bringing the point up. If I could also just yeah. add one final point, which is we discovered recently that the, the mower man and the strimmer man don't go around at the same time. And so there are occasions where the mower man would have done and the strimmer man comes along later, or vice versa. And so sometimes residents feel that only one part's been done and it's been left, but it's actually that the other person is going to come along later to complete the job. Well, they're so later, would they? Yeah. Even necessarily at the same time. We believe that they start at the same time in the, in the week yeah. at the same point, but then one goes quicker than the other, so the second one gets further behind. That's yeah. more or less what we. we, we <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all those very useful details. I know, especially when it comes to summer. Um, any further questions from councillors or Simon? No? Okay, in that case, we shall move on to agenda item five, um, which is about the Seven Sisters National Nature Reserve update what, and the consideration. What was the order? Do we have to know the Oh, God, sorry. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, Right, okay, please may I have a proposal to note the contents of the report. Councillor Meek, second that Councillor Honeyman. All in favour? And myself, everybody. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, now we'll move on to agenda item five. Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to propose that we...
suspend standing orders so that our um, expert visitors can give their presentation. Could I have a seconder? Councillor Meek and a vote on that from the councillors. Everybody in favour? Yes, that's everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, do I need to No, okay, right. We're suspending standing orders as of now. So um, thank you very much for, for attending. Um, and are we going straight into Yeah, and we'll go straight into your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, that's what I'm going to stand, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Please do. I'm referring to you as well as everyone else here. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, who's doing the. You're doing it. No, I'd love you to have a hand, Karen. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us to um, present um, the Seven Sisters LNR to you this evening. Um, I'm Sarah Davis, I'm Principal Officer of the Partnerships for Natural England. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce Kerry. Um, Kerry, do you want to quickly say who you are? Come up with me, that would be nice. I'll stand here. Hi, I'm Kerry Curzon. Um, I'm, I work in protective sites and also on the projects of the NNR for Natural England. <laughs> and then we've also got Henry from Sussex Wildlife Trust. Go on, introduce Sorry, yourself. Hi, I'm Henry from Sussex Wildlife Trust and obviously the relationship with Seeds of the Town Council is absolutely fundamental to us. We love the nature reserve, so we really want to uh, stay part of this conversation and make sure that we're absolutely up to date with what's going on. Thank you. Um, so, today's presentation is to give you a guide um, through what it's all about, about being a super NNR um, and what the process is, is and actually what we're asking you to do is become one of the core partners of the National Nature Reserve going forward, which is called the Seven Sisters NNR. Um, so a bit of background, the NNRs were established under the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act in 1949, which specified that they were there to preserve flora and fauna and geological and physio physiographical features of special interest in the area and for providing opportunities to study and research into those features. So um, in 2006, this was updated by the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act and extended the role of the National Nature Reserves to include the provision of opportunities for the public enjoyment and for open air recreation. So there are three pillars that govern a National Nature Reserve, which is uh, nature conservation, and the second is research, which is the science bit, and the third area is access, which is the people bit. So to become a, a, a super national, national nature reserve, um, you need to get agreement with all the partners involved. And with this particular proposal, there are eight core partners that we're hoping will become approved bodies, which will then be part of the national nature reserve. What it does, it's a chance to have um, create a nature reserve at landscape scale. And in this case, the starting point was to expand the NNR at Lullington Heath. It's definitely not a formal status. This is what we have to be very sure about, is that there's no um, legislation behind becoming a super NNR. It's voluntary. Um, so um, it's really, that is a really, really important point. And so the mechanism of, it, of a super NNR means that it, it's, we, we follow the Lawton principle that it's bigger, it's better, and it's more joined up. And it's working in partnership, in a collaboratory sense with all our neighbours, of, of who are, uh, all the landowners, basically. So there's a big process that Natural England has to go through to ensure that we will um, manage the land in 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 a in appropriate way. And... Um, We've got to go through the whole process of you becoming an approved body, and that's what we're doing now. If successful, the Seven Sisters NNR will become part of the King series of Na National Nature Reserves, and there are five um, that happen every year over a course of uh, five years, so, so there will be 25 in total. And at the moment, there are many um, super NNRs that have gone through this process and they've got their management framework in place. And so there's a lot of opportunities for us to draw on how they've done it and take some of those challenges and some of those opportunities in mind. So there's lots to sort of um, model successes on. Um, map two, please, Kerry. 
So this is, at the moment, this is the map um, of the proposed site. But I just want to draw your attention to all the, um, uh, the logos on the right-hand side at the moment. Because um, these are all our partners. So, um, so these core partners are part of the approved body process. Um, and after we go through the declaration of the Super NNR, then it's down to the partners to manage the NNR within the framework, the management framework. So the, so the eight core partners are Eastbourne Borough Council, and we, we did the presentation to them, I think it was last month, it was even a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, now that they are now an approved body, are they, Kerry? Have we gone through well, that? they will be. They will be. <laughs> They've said yes, basically. The South Downs National Park, they were actually going to come and speak tonight with us, but um, uh, Claire couldn't make it. Um, so they're um, a core partner. South East Water, uh, Forestry England, National Trust, we've put you on there, but we understand we're not there quite yet. And of course, Sussex Wildlife Trust features in that very much so um, with the relationship that you have with seafood. And so there are eight core, core partners that all have to become those approved bodies. So that's the process that we're in at the moment. Um, and then as you can see, it's, it, can you see the colours? Mm -hmm. yeah. So obviously the, the, the seafood land is here, then it butts onto the National Trust, then we've got the South Downs National Country Park, then coming through here with more National Trust land, and then the Eastbourne um, Borough Council's land scooping up there. That's Lullington Heath over there in the blue, and then um, uh, Friston Forest, which is run by Forestry England. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kerry for the next part of it. Well, this is the, the, the this video. Is, oh, it's the video, yeah, of it's course. The video. So <laughs> we've done this. This video has been created because there's something called the um, what's it called? The uh, nature recovery. Thank you. The nature recovery <laughs> project, which is a wider um, nature recovery kind of project within the area, but the super NR is, is is part of that. So this is only two minutes, but we thought we would just play it for you, just to give you an idea of of how the kind of um, the NNR could work together with all the partners involved. Right. Yeah, two seconds, I need to just come out a bit. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Because it went a bit funny from there. Can you see it? Um, right, so sorry. It will be much better on here. Yeah. The export ponies have been strained in, in Sussex with their amazing uh, improvement on grassland, which again is in turn brilliant to improve water quality. So I'm pretty fundamental now. I think we're lucky and blessed to have people that are wanting to understand what we do. So we stood here today at Lullington National Nature Reserve. It's a, a rare habitat. It's a grassland on top of a chalk. We've now been working with South East Water for 20 years. And that thing has been really helpful, particularly to me in terms of helping diversify and showcase what we're doing. For me, there's many projects which you could describe as a nature recovery project, but what we're doing here is trying to draw a load of them together and create something that joins them up. So a lot of people don't know that this is where their drinking water comes from. What happens is the rainfall comes down, it slowly percolates through the chalk geology, and then it's collected. So it's like a sponge. We then drill a borehole into there, and we abstract that water. So really nice, good quality water. It's really important for local communities that we protect and restore nature because the nature and the landscape around us gives us our clean air, it protects our water supply, it gives us good mental health, a beautiful area to walk and connect with nature. We have to find that common ground. What's in it for everyone? And then how do we tell that story to the communities that ultimately this services? Thank 
you. Um, so that just gives you a bit of an idea. We, 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 we want to create another video when we've got all the partners in place to do something similar, which we use as a promotional tool um, to, to tell the story about the Super NLR. Um, right, I'm going to hand over to Karen. Would you like me to do that? Ah, looks okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to follow on from the film, um, the NNR was inspired by the link between protecting drinking water and protecting habitats and species. And the larger map here shows the catchments that surround Seaford. There are two aquifers, one that supplies Seaford and one that supplies Eastbourne. And the other map with the different coloured areas so shows the source protection zones, which need to be managed sensitively to keep the water from needing chemical inputs. And as you can see from both of these maps, the areas above Seaford have more impact on the town's water supply than Seaford Head or the town itself. By, by being part of the NNR, the council can have a direct influence on the land that impacts and can benefit people and nature. And so, yeah, so this slide is just showing a couple of maps um, with the proposed land. So none of this is finalised, and the amount of land to include is still under discussion. Previously, we've discussed options for Unit 4 of the SSSI, the local nature reserve and the golf course. The latest discussions with officers have favoured including the area of SSSI managed by Sussex Wildlife Trust, which is the, the lower part on the larger map. Um, there's potential for affiliating land that will be managed in sympathy with nature conservation. For example, the golf course could be affiliated as there are areas which are managed to benefit na nature such as the scrub, which is beneficial to breeding and passage birds, while other parts of the golf course are not there for the NNR's primary purpose of nature conservation. Um, and Seaford Head has a wide, wide range of habitats supporting many species, some of which are rare or declining, such as the potted flower bee and moon carrot, which are here. Um, the, the NNR benefits land that is already protected. Seaford Beachy Head Triple SI is a useful example of a site in unfavourable declining condition. The council are responsible for Unit 4, shown in red on the map, and there are actions required to work towards favourable favourable condition by addressing the pressures here. This Triple SI land is important for government targets as each Triple SI needs to move towards favourable condition. The NNR partnership are ready to work together to find ways to improve condition of the site by sharing knowledge and equipment the potential for joined up grazing and by connecting existing volunteer networks. Back to you, Sarah. Back to me. Um, so we've done a bit of work with our partners on the NNR's vision and purpose. Um, and we came up, I mean, it took a bit of time to get to this point, um, but we came up with the strap line that we are inspired by water, motivated by nature, and delivered for future de generations. Um, and the focus, I guess, the, the three pillars for this particular NNR is that we are running it for nature, for water, and for people. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Okay. And these are just some of the advantages. Um, there are possibilities of working together to join up grazing and other management techniques, which will be developed through the management framework. This will be designed by all the partners to suit suits each site's needs, while unifying efforts so that organisations aren't working in contradictory ways on their individual sites. The NNR is well placed to make <coughs> connections between the land and the sea, with charismatic species such as the seahorse being supported by freshwater, filtering through the chalk and out to sea into the marine conservation zones. This and other species can engage the public, protect these habitats and species, and can also attract funding opportunities such as the recent seahorse hotels project as well as providing opportunities for volunteering and creating events programmes as a partnership. By making these connections, partner organisations can share experience and knowledge. Oh yeah, so what does this mean for Secret Town Council? So as part of the management framework, a, a climate change vulnerabil vulnerability assessment will be completed with partners to support mitigation and adaptation to climate change. So this will help Supertown's Council's climate emergency policy, in particular the policy to participate in knowledge sharing with other stakeholders and to keep abreast of new evidence, technology and methods which may aid achieving Supertown Council's climate aims. Um, and then the, the Nature Reserves Management Plan 
um, which is very much part of Sussex Wildlife Trust. The NNR can help mitigate the climate change by supporting the aims stated in the management plan of increasing habitat connectivity, undertake adaptive management and ensuring that areas of valuable habitat are bigger and better managed. Um, and we've been asked about the differences between the current status of the site and any changes the NNR will bring. The area is currently designated as a triple SI and the underlying legislation will remain the same with this designation. The area is also declared as a local nature reserve, which is similar to a national nature reserve as they were established under the same act and are both voluntary declarations. The national nature reserve status is given to the best sites in the country that are able to make a significant contribution to biodiversity. Because of this, NNRs attract greater funding opportunities alongside the other benefits that we've previously mentioned. And then these are a couple of case studies that we were also asked to come up with. Um, so commercial activities will still be able to take place on the NNR. Using filming as a case study, the SSI sets the highest level of guidance and restrictions here. The primary purpose of an NNR is nature conservation, this does not exclude secondary purposes, which can include income generation. Any income gained for activities would remain with the partner responsible. There is no obligation for funds to be shared in the partnership. Funding for the NNR will be obtained separately by the partnership to support particular projects and activities within the NNR. Likewise, if input is sought on decisions around any changes for the Hope Gap steps and ways to accommodate increased, increased visitor numbers, these can be considered by the partnership in an overarching visitor strategy. Any operations that need to be carried out will be consented by Natural England in the same way as they're covered by the Triple SI. Um, and we've made progress on the prog process towards declaration, with the partners coming together for meetings across the past year. A significant milestone has been to develop the vision you heard about earlier, as well as the set of principles the partners have agreed to work with each other within this landscape. We are currently finalising the maps and working on the internal process that Natural England requires by drafting the proposal forms. We've recently received the final maps and letters of intent from National Trust and Forestry England. We successfully presented to councillors from Eastbourne Borough Council a couple of weeks ago and after a positive response are awaiting their letter of intent to be included in the NNR. And our first goal in the internal process is our estates panel in March where we present the partnership for NNR. Alongside this, we'll be developing the management framework and comms to share the Seven Sisters NNR aspirations more widely. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for a very informative um, and uh, interesting presentation there. I hope that that's really set the scene for everybody um, and answered some of the questions that have come up already. But one thing I would like to pick up on before I... I put out to further questions. I think it's a very common theme in, in the questions in people's minds, and I know as, we as councillors have received emails on it, is you mentioned that we're still discussing the potential areas which might be included. And of course, in this subcommittee meeting, uh, what we will do at the end of this discussion, once standing orders are reinstated, is vote on whether or not we want to make a recommendation for full council to consider this further. So it's really important to note, as this is a voluntary declaration, but also as we're a subcommittee, we're not making a full and final decision tonight, but we are here to scrutinise and really get into the nitty gritty and, and ask questions of uh, our key potential partners um, tonight. So it's a really good opportunity to kind of get to the bottom of some of these things. Yeah. So um, we've heard from various sources that um, there's perhaps a bit of discrepancy in some of the areas that have been proposed as we've sort of gone through the process and there are you know, bits of land that people might have expected to be included or not to be included. Is there anything that you want to pick up on just to sort of kick off about where we are now with that and where that could go? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, I think the latest discussions were just to simplify it really, um, and that was from the previous town clerk, um, was just to include the land that's managed by Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, so that's that's all I know that on that situation. So it's that is an officer um, decision. So it's kind of it is as I said, it is up to you what you decide to put in. But that's kind of that's where that decision Thank came you. from. Yes. Yeah. I would say as a golf course manager, yep. I thought we might be able to 
ask you the questions or make any points in relation to the Yeah, okay, great. Would you like to, or if you've got questions. to come in, Simon, um, about the golf course? I've probably got many questions, <laughs> and probably not all for tonight. Um, of this first time I've included oh. in it, um, I've got, yeah, the, I think it's a good idea, but I don't understand the boundaries and the decisions made. Um, with regards to where it may be. In, I know this is a uh, indicative design, not yeah. the full. It doesn't, me knowing the site doesn't make sense. And um, I think by the sounds of the public and other people, it's probably a common thought. So I don't, can I ask you a question about the patched area here, which is made? You say it includes Southwick's Wildlife Trust, but this bit isn't included in the proposed. No? I think this is just someone's taken a file on 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 our mapping the system Google and tried to go. Yeah. This is the bit that we're including, so it's yeah. not. So that's what the kind of proper mapping discussions will be for. So okay. We've done that with the other partners who committed, yeah. and then once you know we have a yes no, then it will be. Is it possible to go back to the slide before that? Should we, should we just the slide before that one. Yeah. Could you just explain to me what? Under the stage panel, what do the, are the next ones? Um, so they're different natural England boards. So next code just means natural England, England executive committee, um, and then natural England board, um, and then yeah, declaration. Um, are but, they? Sorry to interrupt. But, um, so the panels of people say from Eastbourne Council, Seaford Council, would they be in the next code in the natural England? No. No, so this, so we have internal processes that we have to follow, so we propose, so we get all the partnership to decide whether they want to be involved or not, um, and then we have internal processes that we have to go through, so we put the proposal form together with obviously partnership input, yeah. and then approved body <coughs> proposal forms. So you make decisions after the approved body? Sorry, say that again. Sorry, if, so you're... Those sort of decisions are made once a say once the a council has become an once a council has already agreed. Yeah. So that is where the decisions are made for them. So we we present Seaford Town Council as an approved body, yeah. and then these are the panels that say yes, we think they can do that because of this, this, and this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Taylor, and then Councillor Matthews. Um, thank you, that was really very interesting and an exciting project, potentially. Um, I, I represent Bishopstone Wall, which is on the far west side of Seaford, and I'm, uh, which is also where the park re-enters Seaford, if you like, um, around Bishopstone Village. Uh, I, and we have the Rookery, Rookery Hill, um, we go down to Poverty Bottom, which you probably know, uh, and we include the um, uh, Tide Mills. So I'm wondering where your western boundary is, 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 if there is such a thing as a western boundary, because, you know, the, the extent of diverse, uh, biodiversity in that area is just incredible, but it doesn't seem to be... You don't seem to be going over that far. Is that right? This is all about Seaford Head, basically. Yeah, I think it's going back to what um, we've already kind of said, is that those decisions were made by um, the previous officer, and it was based on what's uh, right. Sussex Wildlife Trust is. But, but that's not to say that that's, you know... I'm a new councillor, and I was not party to those discussions. Oh, sorry. Okay. I think it's up to Seaford Town Council to decide what goes in it. Yeah, yeah. we don't decide. Okay. Yeah. You, you I think do. also so we, we need to be mindful, if I may, that um, the Town Council don't own the land over that side of town. So if it, if if um, so that area was to come in, then it would be via different yeah. partners. Different so this is um, about where Seaford Town Council... This is about Council Seaford Town Council owned own land. land. Okay. With well, the that, potential for that um, to be involved. But thank you. Thank it's, you. It's a very good question because we are looking at things at landscape scale and, and larger geography. So, yes. Thank it's you. Joined up thinking's all there. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we have Councillor Matthews and then I'll come to Councillor Dumbarton. Okay. 
Good evening. Thank you. That was great. Um, I remember the first presentation. It was, yeah, sounded like an exciting project then. So, um, so I represent East Ward, which is the um, kind of the path going up to Seaford Head. So, so I think my question was, and this is a popular question last week in Port Camps, was around visitors, notably the, um, as the gentleman said, a lot of coaches. The increase in visitor numbers, um, the transport potential transport complications, damage. Um, so, and and the lady there mentioned the flooding at the road as well. So, I guess what I'm interested in the visitor strategy, and what um, do you have any previous? Do you have any examples of maybe somewhere else in the country where? It's very popular on the tourist route and where the visitor strategy has helped. I don't know what advice they've given, what management expertise grants they offered. Did you say that? No, no, I just thought it was an excellent question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't have any examples that I can mention specifically, but we have, we will have examples. So Perbeck Heaths was the first super NNR to be declared. Where was that, sorry? Perbeck Heaths, it's in Dorset. Okay. Um, so we can, you know, we're in close contact with them, we can say what, you know, we've had conversations with them, but, you know, they, we can ask for their visitor strategy and then the impacts that that's had. Um, yeah, so I can provide other examples from a, around the country, but yeah, just not right this second. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think what we understand is if this, this issue is going away, if anything, seafood is becoming more and more popular, especially with like visitors from uh, Asia. So, um, so it's, uh, yeah, we're mindful of the um, the damage and the pollution that's causing. Um, yeah. So I think any advice would be great for you. So, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Devas. Hi. Um, we've been asked to take this forward as a recommendation based on the maps. Um, but the maps are inconclusive because there's no clear definition of what is to be included. Um, on the one hand, you, you're saying that it's up to the council, but there isn't anything on here that shows me what exactly is going to be included. So how can we vote on a recommendation but there's no clear map of what's to be included. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the first bit. The second bit is at 3.13, Natural England's officers were asked to confirm the impacts <coughs> on the operation and the management of the golf course. Has that been delivered? I'm not sure. Shall we start with the first? Oh, and about another maps. one. Okay, let's start with the maps. I think that ties into something before, and then we can go on to point two and three if that's okay. Because I'm sure we'll be bringing in more people to talk to those. So, so with regards to the maps, you were saying earlier about the process that it's kind of a, it's almost like you're seeking um, a potential partner, and then if it's a if it's a go, you get to have further discussions on the maps, and then it progresses to further stages. Would that be with us or solely with Natural England? And how does that work in terms of finalising the boundaries? And you, you said you've done that sort of before. So yeah. I wonder if you might tell us a bit more about why it doesn't have to be concrete just now. Yes. Do you want to yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so what, we've got a little team who, because we're hopeless with the actual mapping in terms of technical skills. So we've got a team who are helping us. Um, and they, I think they've actually sent Steve um, an email already with the, with the files. So that's something that can be looked at, um, and then it's a case of you can draw a line on it, so you can say, okay, this is what we want in, this is what we don't want in. Um, so we're trying to take something that's technical and make it as simple as possible, and then we'll, we'll have lots and lots of back and forth about this is the boundary, and this, we want this excluded, we want this included. Yeah. So if I can just follow up on that, obviously we currently have a management committee for the Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve, which Sussex Wildlife Trust manages but has several other stakeholders. Um, I'm imagining that committee, I mean the committee are already aware of this that's going on, will they be sort of involved as a, a point of contact, uh, not point of contact, a point of sort of input um, in that process perhaps before it comes back to 
the full council if we were to recommend a, recommend it coming through. That's all right. Yep, confirm. <laughs> Uh, the question was, I suppose, what would the role of the current Seaford Head Local Nature Reserve Management Committee be in terms of um, shaping the land that, shaping the proposal for the land that would go in if if we approved this stage of it, and then so would there be those detailed discussions between you know there are certain councillors on that, other stakeholders, um, South Downs National Park, Natural England, obviously the Wildlife Trust, OP officers. Um, and then perhaps come back to full council if, if it would with a sort of more um, worked up plan. Is that how you would? I, I don't know if we know what the process is. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's, it's potential options there, but we do have obviously these groups that we can utilise going forward. Well, I mean, if it was approved that you wanted us to take it forward, we could certainly organise with Sussex Wildlife Trust and other stakeholders that we could get together in the, in the interim to work out what the stakeholders thought should be the areas that were included and then put that forward as a, re as a recommendation, I suppose. And of course when I say we, I mean the golf course as well. <laughs> and does that yeah. include resident air? I don't know who so you want to have it. Residents can certainly feed into councillors in Bill. that process. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. Bill. <laughs> Bill, do you belong to any of these organisations? So I didn't quite catch that. Do you belong to any of the organisations? No. So. so how would Bill feed in? Bill would feed in by councillors. Ward councillors. Ward councillors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious you've got two extra points there. Yeah, so Steph, and we've also got some further questions. Yeah, my, my residents do not want more visitors, do not want to promote the reserves, the Seaford Head or anywhere else. They're fed up with the parking problems, they're fed up with the toilet problems. They don't want to they don't see how a small town like us should pay for those toilets for a, a what is now a, a, a national tourist site that's popular worldwide. Um, likewise with the Hope Gap steps, I'm glad they were mentioned because they want to see those reinstated. We already agreed at a previous council that we were going to get a surveyor in to look at that and nothing's happened. So we need to progress that as a matter of urgency as well as looking at the residents' concerns. It seems that it's all about natural England and all the others. Yes, the nature of it is great, but the people and the tourism, the increase in that is a problem. And now, to my residents, I've not had one resident say yes, vote for it. They've all said no. Thanks for that Thank feedback. You. I think we'll go on to more of a discussion once we reinstate standing orders as to the actual okay. recommendations and so on. But I think just to sort of pick up a broad flavour there, I mean, I think we're all very aware of the pressures that we're facing um, in terms of visitor numbers, um, frequency and all that. Um, and feeding that into, I mean, there were sort of three pillars which the National Nature Reserves were sort of built on and inspired by, I suppose, conservation, recreation, oh, sorry, conservation research, and then opportunities for public enjoyment and recreation and access. And yeah, I just wondered if, I mean, I was going to ask anyway, if you could pick up a little bit more about um, the opportunities that there might be with the partners working together in such a way um, for addressing some of these growing and burning concerns that we have here in Seaford. Um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of other places, I think, you know, we reflect a national uh, trend where people are getting out into the outdoors a lot more since COVID. People are going abroad less often due to cost and other things. Um, and they're, they're spending their time at home, but obviously that's making everywhere a lot busier and here it's just gone up exponentially. So, yeah, it'd be great if, if you could give a few examples of that, but also sort of how do we retain our local input and control I suppose um, you know our current management plan who would still be actually um, 
the key influences in how that's run, would that be overpowered by other larger organisations from around about, or, or would we be sort of still quite autonomous but just open to volunt- open to advice kind of thing? How do you how do you envisage that happening? Should I start off? Sure. Um, I, th- I think the um, the thing about you know, autonomous and all working, it's, it's all about working in partnership with others. And I think the, 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 the principles that we go with is, is it's better to be work, working together than just being isolated away on your own. Um, I think some of the other benefits are around funding and um, other super NNRs have got um, big funding bids in from landscape recovery projects and national nature reserve projects, um, funding that they would do, they would do together. Um, so that would be a, another benefit for, for the council. Um, and then in terms of the uh, visitors and um, the additional people coming to um, you know, the wonderful place that you have here, um, you know, that will all be in the management framework. And it, it will be up to you to influence that to make it work for Seaford. And Eastbourne will be doing the same and the National Park will be doing the same. So it, it, everyone has those, those concerns themselves as well. So it's kind of working collaboratively together to iron out it together rather than doing it on your own, basically. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we had further questions. Yeah, uh, and then we'll go to um, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, just to come back to what you were saying a few minutes ago, you were saying how would the other stakeholders of Seaford and Local Nature Reserve Management can have an input. I don't think that's relevant. We are being asked specifically as a town council, as the landowner, for our agreement to do this. This is not to do with the other stakeholders. We're being asked personally. Some of the stakeholders are already involved in this and have either given their permission or not. And they might be Sussex Wildlife Trust. They might be South Downs National Park. We're being asked because we're the landowner in this particular instance. So I think we have to make that decision without reference to the, the other stakeholders. I mean, some of those are, you know, the Sussex Oil Authority Society. Well, you know, they're not a direct, you know, stakeholder. They are advisory stakeholders, but they're not actually, you know, we've been benefited from those other groups feeding into our, I think, but we are the landowners and we have to make this decision, I think. Um, what I always wanted to say was, um, in, in response to Mr. Downing, we, you, you, how autonomous can we be? We can't be very autonomous already because we're already beholden if we are asking to do anything on Seaford Head Estate. We have to defer a lot of the time to Natural England, to the South Downs National Park, often to Sussex Wildlife Trust because they already have vested and often legal interests which are higher than ours. So I, I, I know what you're saying, but there was, you know, how autonomous can we be? I don't think we can be that autonomous anyway, because we are under so many restrictions because, you know, it's an SSSI. It, it, it's, you know, part of very other bigger landscape issues. So I, I think we are constricted already. And although we're being asked to make a decision on this as a town council, we can do that but we are still beholden on a bigger scale to other bodies. So I don't think we should get above our boots and think that we can be independent and, uh, and, and autonomous, because we can't anyway. Uh, so I think we've got to work within the, within the framework that we already have. Um, I, I agree that the maps do need to be sorted out, but in response to what you were asking, in a way I don't think that matters too much, because I think what's being pointed out is that we're asking an imprint for an in principle uh, decision and the fine details can be worked out later and that we can feed into that in, 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 with you and with Sussex Wildlife and with other bodies we can make those decisions later but I think we're asking if, if, if that's alright with everybody I think we're just being asked for an in principle agreement as far as I understand it. Thanks for that Thank Councillor Mee, thank you. Uh, Sharon do you have a question for um, our presenters? Yeah, so it was just about really us as officers for Seaford Town Council working with the NNR and the framework. So are we, at the moment we do have a meeting um, with all of the bodies for that work on the nature preserve, but we are working all together to make those decisions locally. At the, if we're in the NNR, how 
how close are we to making the decisions for the land that we're already making decisions at a local level? Will the decisions then have to be taken somewhere else, like approval for Natural England that we need to put in? Or what? How, how's that going to work in the framework, I suppose? I think the main impact of the framework is to ensure that no landowner that's adjacent or in the area is working in, you know, making certain choices that are contradicting something that's happening. So your, skill, your management plan feeds into the framework. So everything that you make decisions on within that plan and the work that you want to happen on Seaford Head will feed into the framework. So it's saying this is what Seaford wants to achieve from this, rather than the framework kind of dictating and telling you what to do. So it's it, the framework's there to kind of make sure we're all thinking along the same lines. So would that be that we're locally feeding in for it to filter up to then come back down? But also would that be that if we want to do something here in Seaford because we're part of something bigger, that Eastbourne have to be doing the same as what Seaford's doing? No, no. I'm no. just as in we're obviously running along the same coastal path, touching land. Yeah, no, it's not It's not so you have to be doing the same thing, but it's obviously, we want things to complement each other, but part of the partnership is maybe not everyone can tick all of the NNR boxes, so it's like we, we might not want to do this for visitors, but over there they might want to say, okay, well, we're going to do this for visitors, or all the same, we might not be able to protect this part specifically for this species, but we can do that elsewhere on the land, so it's working across the whole landscape mm. to try and kind of make sure something is happening somewhere in a joined up sense. Sorry, Henry, I think yeah, you wanted to say. I just wanted to add from how my perspective of how I think it would work would be for the management of Seaford Head, we actually, rather than being told what to do by others, it'd be more, there'd be more options for us to choose from because of more collaboration. And I think that anybody who's managing a site, and there's all those different sites that were shown on the map, everyone's doing it in isolation. And so it's innovation will come that will be better for all of them by working together. And I think this is what brings people together and gives more options. The management plan for Seaford Head will still be the management plan for Seaford Head. Mm. And the decision making for that will still sit with the people who make decisions about Seaford Head. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, do you have a question on this side? Yes. Sorry, um, I've got two questions. Maybe one for Sunset, one I've just one for Natural England. Um, I've had some meetings recently with a couple of Natural England uh, members, um, Carol mm -hmm. and Madeline. Uh, um, if, if we were a member of the AMR and we wanted to, we we're looking at stewardship, stewardship schemes and grants. Um, and going on the look, rural land registry, would Seaford Head be on that, or would the NNR as a whole be on? If if we if we wanted to register the land as a certain type, um, would it be part of the NNR's decision? Mm. I don't quite know the, the legislation behind it. Registered the land for what? For stewardship? Yeah. Yeah. So, NNR wouldn't. No, it wouldn't NNR be. doesn't feature on um, the land registry. No, it, 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 would be, it wouldn't be via the NNR. No, okay. But as part, if we were part of the NNR, would. How linked would that be to the other members within it and the ones we are joining to and stuff like that? Do you mean we'd be restricted from doing that because we're in the NNR? Is that what you Yeah. Mean? Like, depend, and, depend, and rather than being a separate area, to have a boundary where we might register that, or would we be restricted in that? I'm not quite I'm sure I understand the question, but I mean, we can take it away and ask our colleagues who know more about that, but I don't, yeah. I, my basic answer would be no, you wouldn't be restricted, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure I understand the question fully, so. We can take it away. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, would it be an NNR register or would it be a, no. still be a secret head? It would still be a secret head, I know that. And the boundary of, mm. if we registered a boundary, it would be where we, we asked for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, and question for Wildlife Trust. I hope I can answer you, that. Yeah, um, on, so just... if, look at these drawings at the moment, I know there's discussions of boundaries. Yeah. What would, 
how would you look at the management between the areas that aren't in and the areas that are? Or would you I, look at that as a whole? I know that the, the lease that we have on Superhead, my understanding is there's areas that we manage directly and areas yeah. that we just simply advise on. Yeah. So I, it's Mark Monterey who you probably know who who does who leads all the work on our behalf. So I yeah. just absolutely take his advice on that. Okay. okay. So a couple of things to follow up on after. So thanks for the questions. Thank you for your input. Okay. Do we have any more questions to the presenters? Okay. Councillor Honeyman. Couple of points. I think I think you may have half answered it, but I think some of my have answered it actually. But um, so basically, whatever happened, the bit that Wildlife Trust manage on behalf of us, you do it anyway. As you were going to say, with the with the the local the local nature reserves still exist. Um, if there was the the national one, as that's the so with the the bits are going to be included. You still don't have the local one. And your definition of a super NNR as well. I mean, I mean that's, is that just something? Is that um, official, or is that just something you like using ad hoc, or would you like using it that word? Uh, um, I think I think I've always answered it, but. I just don't know if, if, if both schemes have been devised in 1949, post Second World War, um, why has it taken this long for us all of a sudden to get so much interest in the NNRs as opposed to local nature reserves? Um, yes, yeah. Um, so, Three so questions, haven't they? Yeah, so. Yeah. Which I think, I think so you've answered that, haven't you? The first one, sort of thing, by nodding. I think so. It's still it was still be a local nature reserve, the yeah. areas were not included it's, in the... It's a really interesting question about whether being a national nature reserve somehow supersedes, is it more important or less? Which is more important? Well, you told me. I, I, I don't think, I don't think one's more important than the other. They, they would both exist as well. Yeah. They yeah. don't cancel yeah. each other out. Yeah. Um, and on the super NNR, this was a term that was first introduced to describe partnership NNRs and then I think it was found, you know, some people like it, some people don't like it. So we also say partnership NNR just to represent the fact that it's um, not just one body that's managing it. That's and obviously it's very complex <laughs> because obviously when you look at the map, it, I mean, it covers vast areas, yeah. way, way outside of the Town Council area, yes. you know, right over Wilden the work. So, um, yeah, so I can see why it's a really Substitute new a super partnership really yeah. you know, so more efficiently. Yeah. Okay. I think that's most of it, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Do we have any further questions for our um, presenters? Right. I will now go to further questions from the public, but I'm going to ask you to sort of keep it to a couple of minutes because we're now quarter past eight. But please do go ahead and ask your question, gentlemen. Second from the end. Um, yes, uh, just to come in on what the gentleman from the golf course was saying about stewardship. If you go onto Deathrope's website and look at those magic maps, you will find that if you tweak all the options on there, you get layers of stewardship, you get layers of. There are umpteen layers. And this is what I think is possibly causing confusion because there's a huge great um, nature renovation or something area just next to the, the plans there, which doesn't seem to have been enclosed. I don't know what it does, but it's a designated area. I don't know how many designated areas just in Lovington Heath happens to come into it, but it, this is what is occasionally causing confusion. Because if you don't know, then how do we know? Because you're, I mean, you are the sort of head body for nature in England, mm -hmm. are you not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you should know all the stewardship and every other layer that comes underneath. Uh, so I, 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 yeah, I, I suggest mean, this is what is causing some confusion. If we don't all know how many different areas any given area comes into, well, we, I mean, I don't, I don't do know where, where the SDNP, which I thought was the overall top dog for this area, huge area, uh, stands in relation to natural England and forest England and any other England agencies, which all have headquarters in various different parts of the country and offices that 
very difficult to identify. Thank you very much for the question. I think, I, I'm, I don't, did we all hear that up this end of the room? I don't know if I need to sort of perhaps summarise a little bit. Please do. Um, I think the flavour of the question was about the kind of um, hierarchies or tiers of organisations, but also perhaps legislations which different lands, land comes under. And say you've got a parcel of land and it comes under A, B and C and D. Well, which one, which one is... is you know, the sort of critical one and how do they all work together? And I think it's a great question because, you know, even though I've worked a lot of my life in sort of the na nature side of things, it, it can still be very confusing, you know, when you have to look up what sort of designations there are, what voluntary designations, who are the stakeholders, who's an advisor, who's a statutory advisor, all these kind of things. And one thing I would say is if we do um, <coughs> vote to put this forward to full council tonight, I was going to ask that we have some sort of diagram which just shows a little bit the stakeholder relationships and that, those kind of levels, because I think that would be really useful going forward. But perhaps there's something you'd like to say directly to our uh, member of the public just now about this area specifically, so please go ahead. Well, I mean, in ter terms of protected sites and triple SIs, they are absolutely, that's, it. that's what um, we look after, um, but then Forestry England and other agencies, they have their own remits. Um, in terms of you know, the pecking order, if you like, we're the government's um, advisory body for nature recovery. Um, so, but within that, they're, they're, it's, it's just incredibly complex. But I think um, trying to get through it all, I mean, your point about head offices and things like that, in terms of natural England, our head office is in York, but we have kind of all, almost regional, regional devolution. So the, the area that we work on is Sussex and Kent, and we have a regional director who oversees all the work that we do that feeds into the national remit. Um, he's in Oxford, I believe. I'm sorry? He, he's in Oxford, I believe. No, he's in, he lives in, he's in Kent, oh. our director. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think we'll probably come to our final question okay, before we start standing on. Two again. things. One, it says you're going to be finalising the maps in November 24. We've got one week left. And that doesn't seem to be happening somehow. And secondly, how does, did I understand it correctly when you mentioned about landowners encroaching on areas? How does that follow through with planning permission and the fact that Lewis District Council controls all of our planning? I can pick up the thing about planning, if I may. Um, but yes, we do have some areas which fall under district council, but we've also got um, various areas that follow under the national park as the planning authority as well. Um, it's a national park up there, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so we do, in, in the area of Seaford, we have two different planning authorities. Okay, because we've got national trust on one side of the head and you've got the... Uh, at the top you've got that and then we've got a field that is trying to be developed with 40 to 50 houses just mm -hmm. below Seaford Head. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of an interesting one. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, this, this being a voluntary designation, um, I'm not sure how much of that would come in and affect a planning process, but perhaps it's a question that we can go and research a little bit more or whether you've got any experience from other areas because you know, it's not part of a legal framework, so I don't think it will touch that particularly strongly. But, yeah, sorry, there, there was another question before that which you may want to pick up on. Um, yeah, this slide is optimistic, so <laughs> <laughs> at the time it seemed like November would be finalising all maps. We finalised all the other maps, um, and then we were going to um, present to the council in September, um, and then that didn't happen, so it's kind of, yeah, it's just an optimistic November on there. Right. And it's very flexible, it's and these, these times have changed many times. Okay. <laughs> it's also worth just mentioning that the SDNPA is one of the partners, isn't it, of the yes. NR? Yes, yes. So that they, as a planning authority, will be fully um, ingratiated in this arrangement, as I understand. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if we have no further questions for the presenters, which I don't think we do, thank you very much for a really great session and for standing up for the grilling and giving us so many more details. I know there are two or three points to sort of take away and maybe bring back, which is, is as to be expected, but thank you so much for...
coming down and, and sharing that with us tonight. So thanks. Right, so I will now invite you to go back to your seats. Yes. Um, and I will propose that we reinstate the standing orders of the meeting. Um, may I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Honeyman and all those in favour? Thank you very much. So, um, Dawn, thank you. Right, we're, we're back in standing orders. Um, so we've now got an opportunity for a bit of discussion. We've got a bit, an opportunity for a bit of discussion here amongst the members and um, our officers. Um, thank you very much to Steve for preparing the written part of this report. Is there anything, Steve, that you would like to sort of sum up or point out on the report before we go to further discussion? <coughs> Through the chair, I think I'd say that recommendation 2A could be and maybe should be amended um, given that it, it talks about the About the, including the area of land currently designated and I don't know if we're at the point of agreeing what land we do want and don't want in it but that's for, you know, for councillors to decide but it specifically says to include the land of the SSSI and the local nature reserve and I don't know if councillors want to agree that all of that goes in there or you know, want to keep that open yeah, okay, thank you. So maybe that's something we, we can bear in mind as we go on. We might, if we if the discussion goes that way, we might want to say, you know, subject to uh, final approval and an input on the on the final boundaries. Which means we thank need you. to amend the recommendation before and vote on the amendment before we then vote on passing that. Yeah, sure. Um, is there feeling in the room that that's something we might want to discuss as, a, as an amendment now, given the discussions we've had about the um, opportunities for the boundaries be sort of fine-tuned as things go forward uh, as a more sort of efficient way of having our discussion tonight or do you feel more comfortable doing that later on? Or oh, oh, we can leave it to say that because it can be amended when it goes to full counts. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be amended. Have to be, yeah. yeah. I think um, I'd rather see it amended now. You'd rather see it amended yeah. now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, Simon. I don't know if I can say so at this point. Um, we're at 2.8. <coughs> isn't particularly clear because the map here doesn't include all of the Lakes Reserve or the Triple SI. Mm. So I don't see how that can be agreed because the map doesn't Yeah, so we, you're saying there's an existing conflict perhaps yeah. in, the, in the content of the appendix in the report. So it probably would be a safer option to put a degree of ambiguity around it which is open to change going forward. Mm. Um, so shall we suggest some wording? Um, do you want to or shall I? You cannot work in the Okay, Shall I go to, to agree to include um, a, the area of land centred on, uh, land at Seaford Head centred um, on the current designation of a triple SI and local nature reserve, but open to um, and yet to be confirmed, or yet you know, yet um, still s still being negotiated, or something. I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, subject to finalisation. Um, <laughs> subject to further finalisation by the by. I don't know. Anyone else got it? No. Right. <laughs> to agree. Yeah. Boundaries. Yeah, but boundaries to be to be finalised um, mm -hmm. as part of the process going forward. Yeah. yeah, maybe to agree land at Seaford Head. Boundaries yet to be confirmed as part of the Seven Sisters National Nature Reserve. Yeah. Please. And then we can still include those, those as we like. Councillor Taylor. I'm, I'm just wondering in relation to the boundaries, what the, the map, the slide that I found particularly difficult to read, and maybe because I'm sitting some distance away from it. Was were the boundaries? You were showing us the boundaries. I'm not asking you to go back to it. Yeah, we'll but um, discussion. it yeah. was very difficult to absorb and yeah. uh, quickly. Yeah, so that's we, fine. So there'll be there'll be future opportunities to, to to negotiate those. Yeah, uh, Councillor uh, Matthews. Um, just a officers really, mm -hmm. it might be helpful to have uh, colour copies on this page because there's so many of it. Yeah, thank so, you. Okay, we'll take that away. And um, mm -hmm. if, if, if it does come to full council, we'll pass yes. some colour copy. We've got on the desk. Thanks for that.
point. Okay, so we've come yeah. up with an amendment okay. um, wording which if you want to adopt or not, which is that we there's a proposal to amend recommendation 2A to instead read to agree land at Seaford Head boundary yet to be confirmed as part of the Seven Sisters National Nature Reserve by providing an extra of intent. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to propose the words as the interim town clerk has put forward. Would anyone like to second that as an amendment? Sure. Uh, Councillor Buchanan, all in favour? Mm. Anybody against? Any abstentions? Okay, we'll go with that amendment. So that's just voting on the amendment rather than voting that we agree with the amendment, just to be clear, the way, the way that it works. Okay, great. So is there anything else you would like to pick up on no, in particular? No, okay. Any points and questions? Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a quick one. We were talking earlier about a diagram of stakeholder relationships. Is that something that sits in this, or is that obviously going to be available <coughs> because that's how things have been discussed? I think, I mean, in our discussion as we suspended standing orders there, um, the the request was for if we were to approve this at this stage to recommend it to full council that such a diagram would be provided in the report to full council when it comes. Um, so I don't think it's something we've got just at this moment. Okay. It, it, does that answer your query? Or? Well, yeah. It just needs to not fall off the edge, if you see me. Yes, absolutely. Um, notice. Thank you. Through the chair, I think you know yeah. we'll, we'll take a note and officers will, officers will chase that up after the meeting. Thank you. I don't know if it needs to be a recommendation. Or no, I think, no, I think sure. that's, we've got an assur assurance there. Thank you very much. Um, any further points, questions, or comments? Councillor Taylor. Uh, one more. Yes. Um, I don't want us to lose, <coughs> and obviously just we are going to, but I'm concerned that we keep this whole issue of access um, in the foreground. Um, because um, it's proving already proving difficult in relation to the the Chinkton area, um, and from what we've been saying, um, Councillor Duda, um, people on the seafront are feeling um, concerned about this as well. We we've got to come to grips with it because we can't just shut down and say sorry, no more people can come here, and. It, even if we could, that would not be doing the town the service it needs. We need to grow this town. We've got to grow up to productivity. We can't just close down and sort of stay as we are. So the access issue, I think, is really crucial um, to what we're talking about here. It would be very interesting to know more from Purbeck. I am somewhat familiar with the West Country and it would be very um, good to know in a bit more detail how they are dealing with this. I can remember just TV program photographs of, you know, that path going down to the sea, you know, of, like, during the times of COVID, absolutely packed with people. And I know what that's like. So if we could have more information about that, I think it would be really useful. Thank you. Thanks for that point, Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sorry, this is just an aside, really, but coming on to that point. Uh, we all recognise we've got a problem with visitor numbers coming here. And I think part of the problem with that is that there's, is part of your remit, but also part of South Downs National Park remit, yeah. which is trying to provide a place for nature mm -hmm. and to provide access for as many people of different varieties of diversity to access as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Those things are completely contradictory things to try and do. But I'm afraid what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage people to engage with nature. Nature actually doesn't want to be engaged with. It wants to be left alone. And that's the problem we've got. We've also, at the full council meeting a week ago, we were told by a lady that uh, there's, I think he's either a pop star or a film star, Asian film star, who has 125 million followers, has identified Seaford Head as one of the best five places to visit in the UK. That's not going to be very helpful. And, and, and if we can get some finance or something to help us to try and regulate or to decide how we can manage. And I, I don't necessarily agree that we want to grow our town. I think we need to make it accessible. We've got to somehow control how visitors come. 
and I don't, we don't, I, any of us know how that could be, and that's part of the reason we've asked for some money uh, 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 from the uh, South, South Hill Barn Working Group to try and work out what to do with traffic. It's going to cost money to do this. And as a town council, we've got to fund that because it's our estate. But we, if we could get help from Grant or something to do that, because otherwise all those people are going to impinge on what we're all trying to do to a national nature reserve or a national park. So I think that is where collaboration can come together and funding can help our problem with traffic, which we've already got. And that's the problem. Going forward, we're going to have even more problems. Thank you very much, Councillor That's a great point. Um, was there a question, Councillor Honeyman? Do you have a I point? Thank you, Chair. It follows on really from what um, both Councillor you know, Meek and Councillor Taylor going really. And it's all about, as you say, this, the business about access, providing access. Um, you know, obviously, ultimately, it came out, it came out of the originally 49 legislation, didn't it? And obviously, Amanda has time as I included in the 81 and 2006 and so on. But obviously, lots of other bodies do that as well, don't they? Because the National Parks came out of that original same same legislation, didn't it? It's how you restrict and as, you, as well need be at that same time providing access. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, there's so many different bodies which do get involved with this side of things, and it, and it can um, be a bit of a paradox. With well, at, one, at one level, you're, you're sort of saying, you know, let's everyone go up to South Carolina down the, and look at the pictures of the, of the Seven Sisters and the Coke Cottages. On the other hand, you can say, no, we can't do that, it's too many people. So, whether or not the NNR would make any difference from that point of view, I, I, that's open to interpretation. I don't think it's that clear in here. If that's what our ultimate aim is, if we're looking at the wider NNR, which is what we're looking at, then probably don't do any harm joining it. But I'm not sure if it's going to. Obviously, I've heard, heard what the officer says, what Shan says. I bet some of the local things you probably, probably be able to, wouldn't be any difference. It's, it's when you start getting into the bigger projects, maybe and you want more money, then maybe that's where it would help. But that's just my own thinking. Thank you. Thanks for your input and, and that contribution. Uh, does anybody else have any points? Yes. Uh, through the chair. Through the chair, yes. Through the chair. Yes. Through the chair. Um, <laughs> I've got two keywords I've written down through this whole thing. Um, my priority is golf. I've managed, I've done a lot of work with nature to improve it as I'm in charge. Um, access is a word that I have an issue with. Um, not only through the problem with the amount of visitors we're getting to see for the health and safety for the golf. Um, part of the nature reserve is open access land, but golf courses are accepted from that because of the health and safety risk, same as mines, race courses, things like that. Might be in, but they're still not open access. Um, and the other word I've got is erosion. Our sheep head nature reserve on its own has a very unique problem, which is erosion. And the NNR, as far as I can see on the map, going inland don't have that same issue. Mm. I can see some <coughs> people that there. Our triplet side shrinking every day. Mm -hmm. One day it won't be there. Mm. Um, so I think consideration needs to be taken to erosion yep. and whether the NNR can do as much as a local nature does specifically to that issue. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Thanks very much for those points. Mm -hmm. um, I might indulge myself as chair in an opportunity to speak now if everybody else has had their input. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, erosion, um, these big challenges that we've got here in Seaford, we've got um, increased visitor impacts, we've got climate change, we're right at, we're on the edge which is something you know, I used to hear a lot when I lived up in Scotland with the erosion up there, but we're on the edge down here as well. Um, we're going to be seeing many of the effects of climate change probably sooner and more violently than, than perhaps some other parts of the UK in terms of our storms and so on and so forth. So um, I really like the idea of uh, progressing this to full council, for full council to um, scrutinise and decide whether we want to um, pursue becoming an approved body. Um, I really see the benefits in collaborative partnership working. I think having a voluntary larger area where people are actively working together, sharing knowledge, 
staying at the forefront and the leading edge of these issues and bringing that, that knowledge to, to us here in Seaford and hopefully in time we can contribute to that as well is going to be beneficial but we're, crucially we're going to be retaining the management plan that we've currently got and we can sort of leverage the advice, perhaps the funding um, and know-how of other organisations and when it comes to things like erosion we are obviously right here on the coast. There are other places in the country who have got pioneering projects going on, um, whether it's through mechanical means, energy means. Um, my sister's working on a project up in the northeast with seagrass and um, seaweed, looking at um, attenuation of uh, wave impact and all these kind of things, as well as all the nature stuff. There's a lot going on, and I think if we've got a sort of larger, more powerful, more connected entity here on land, then it will give us greater weight in interacting with projects that might be on the marine side as well or, or the rivers and so on and so forth and we can just do that in a much more efficient and joined up way because they're things that we're going to have to address and as Councillor Meeker said we can't address them on our own we're going to need to to be working together so we do have some really acute issues here in Seaford centred around you know visitors parking pollution um, rubbish litter um, you know all these types of things but we have got various things kind of on the boil here uh, access particularly hope gap steps i'm not going to wax lyrical about when i was a child and down there and how it inspired me because i'm sure most people in this room have heard that at least half a dozen times but i think it's really important connecting people with nature but balancing that impact on nature because actually the more we connect people to nature particularly in the earlier years the greater their respect for nature that they'll carry through life and the more likely we are to evolve as a kind of society if you will that that hopefully has you know less impact uh, on things like climate change so yes i think it's all about balance and how can we create a balance probably by coming together listening <coughs> to our residents listening to what people here in the town want the impact of, of places around us we really need to safeguard our, our drinking water supply which is absolutely crucial um, and if we can do that by enhancing nature at the same time then to me that's a win-win um, so yeah so so I um, if I may I'm actually going to propose that we um, go through the recommendations now uh, if councillors are happy to, to go on to that stage um, so I'll take us yes yes possibility that we can include something because we have this carrot dangle to us that says there are opportunities for funding to create a visitor strategy um, but it's not in the proposal there in the motions is there any way to include that in because it, you know it's all about it becoming a nature reserve on the one hand but there's nothing about this visitor problem on the other I think I mean something which will certainly ask officers to take forward and I don't know perhaps the town clerk might say whether this actually needs to be a formal recommendation is when it, we've got this opportunity if we if we do decide to bounce this forward to full council you know to have the diagram to have uh, the colour map that councillor matthews asked for to have perhaps a bit more detail of some of the types of funds that might be available um, particularly through some of the larger partners and i will say from my own experience these funds you know they might not exist one year but they'll exist two years later the funding landscape changes we've obviously had new central government come in very recently and stuff is starting to trickle down now and you know it's still early stages but so the funding opportunities that might be there in two or three years won't be the same as now we hope that they might be better but but you know so i think something indicative would be great but we probably wouldn't be able to say for concrete exactly this will be that but by having the people in the room hopefully that you know, it will help those conversations and those opportunities come to light. Is is that mm -hmm. okay for you? The problem I've got with that is we've got we've had this before where we've had discussions in this meeting and councillors have said, <coughs> Oh yeah, but can we include that? Can we include that? Yeah, 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 yeah. But if it's not in the motion, it's not recorded, I'll take them forward. So that is my only concern here. Through, through the chair, yeah. I can assure you that we are taking notes of what is being discussed and we will try and take those forwards. I mean, you can put it in the recommendations if you like. But. Yeah. Well, um, before the paper comes to full council, because it, if, if it's voted forward, because it was made at this committee, will that paper be bounced off myself and Roger's chair and vice chair before it goes to full council for having a look at? 
or how, how do you envisage that working? Um, I, I, we can just sort of like can, check we, that we, everything's in there that we said would be in we there. We can do that if you want, yeah, if awesome. you want us to do that. I, mean, yeah. I don't think that's a normal process, but we can do we can include that process if you like. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, we'll make sure between us that those points are in there. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, can I point of order? Yes, Councillor. So, is it, are we going to have a lot of that, another rerun of this with full presentations again, or is it going to be a little bit of a shorter situation? You have half an hour discussion. I would hope it would day. be. I mean, obviously, I don't chair full council, I know, no, but, <laughs> but I, would, I would hope, uh, yeah. and, and I understand the rationale, is that we've had um, quite a detailed discussion here. Yeah. So some of the point, or all of the points that we've, the main points that we've kind of mm. brought forward, would be captured in that report to full council, sort of almost like a sort of summary. Um, obviously, with our recommendations, if we make them, is, is that fair? Through the chair, yeah. My recommendation to the to the mayor would be that it's. The chair of this committee makes a short pricey of what the debate was discussed this evening. Uh, we will include a paper version of the presentation in the pack for councillors and then I would be proposing to the mayor that we have a time limited debate on yeah. on the discussion followed by a vote. Obviously it's up to the chair whether she rec accepts that recommendation or not but that would be my recommendation so that we don't have to rehash the whole thing again. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for that point. Uh, that question. Um, okay. In that case, so I'm going to take them individually. I think. Um, so we've we've got one two A and two B, and we've got an amendment on two A. So I'll just start with the straightforward one. So the rec first recommendation <coughs> is to note the contents of the report. May I have a proposer, Councillor Meek? Are you guys okay? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, second, a Councillor Buchanan, and everyone in favour, please show your hands. So that's. Ever on councillors in favour of, of part one. Thank you very much. So that's passed. So I'll now move on to um, recommendation two, section A, for which we, which I'll ask the officers to read out again, just so that we're all clear on that. To clarify, the section two uh, recommendation two A has been changed. So it reads: to agree land at Seaford Head boundaries yet to be confirmed as part of the Seven Sisters National Nature Reserve by providing a letter of intent. Okay, may I have a proposer please? I would like to propose Councillor Meek and second to Councillor Matthews. And all those in favour, show of hands. Right, so that's everybody again. Thank you, so no abstentions and no none against. Thank you very much. So um, two part A has been passed. So we'll now move on to two part B which is to approve Seaford Town Council becoming an approved body via Natural England's processes and under Section 35 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 in order to manage the land as a national nature reserve. So this is about getting that approved body status to allow Seaford Town Council to, to pass forward and of course we're just recommending this to full council. May I have a proposer? Anyone like to propose that? Councillor Meek and a seconder, Councillor Taylor. And all in favour, please show your hands. Okay, that's again unanimous. Thank you very much. Excellent. Right, so that's that item on the agenda done. Thanks for everybody for your contributions to that. That was a great discussion tonight. We're all back to present correct. So the chairs in the chair. Excellent. Right, we're restarting. Um, thank you very much for bearing with the meeting so far. I think this item, I hope, will be relatively quick compared to the others, but nevertheless we'll continue to give everything the full attention and scrutiny that it deserves. So um, thank you very much to Isabel for preparing this report <laughs> um, and for being with us uh, here this evening. Um, so it's the purpose of it is to kickstart efforts to consider ways in which the operation of the council offices could seek to reduce its reliance on printing and paper usage. I know this is something we've spoken about a bit, you know, quite early on when we, we came into term. And uh, there's a few ideas here and proposals about how we can uh, further move things forward. Um, so I'll pass over to Isabel if you would like to highlight any key aspects of your report in terms of what you're proposing. I've got anything particular to highlight. I welcome some questions if you've got any questions that you want to ask. Oh my goodness, okay, great. I'd like no. to highlight something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't printed it yet. I don't, I've, I've never 
have printed papers and I don't understand what other councillors don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just download it onto my computer and I bring the computer and I do it the view. I, I don't see a problem with doing that. And I, don't, I, I do understand it's actually quite easier, much easier to flick over papers like that mm -hmm. as opposed to scrolling through. But you get used to scrolling through. And then if there's a confidential item, uh, I just delete it. It's, it's not a problem. I, I've done it all the time I've been on the council. And I don't... And we get, we get at LDC, we get issued with computers. I know, and I, and I, the other point I wanted to make was, in the report, I would have a problem with that. I don't want another computer. So I know your issue is confidentiality, but LDC do it okay. I don't, and they have support officers, admittedly IT support, uh, and I don't know whether they could provide us with IT support. But what I was going to say was, I don't see that there's a confidential problem, that the problem with um, you know stuff going missing on someone's private computer. But I wouldn't want another computer, uh, and I would have a problem with it because I just sometimes I've had to take two computers with me because my LDC stuff is on the LDC computer, but I also I've got town council or private stuff to do. It's on my computer. I had to take two computers to run this. Just I don't want to take you three. <laughs> Whatever it might. Thank so you very much. Thank you for your, your personal input there. It's a food <laughs> thought for everybody, I'm Thank sure. Uh, Councillor Honeyman, I believe you had I think you're just saying that the, 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 the three level council, some people just went on the one council and, and they probably have this down. They, most people use, use that, don't they? So you could almost have set it up so you've got your, your, three, your three email addresses on one computer or two if you're double added down the council. So that, that's often the way of that. As long as the appropriate councils know, and I don't think that's an issue, that's just something I'd notice what, what Council Mink was saying. Um, what else I'm going to say, yes, I mean, I could, obvious thing here tonight is there's no plugs, so that'd be fun, um, absolutely no plugs at all, so you obviously offices have got plugged their stuff in, but if you've got long meetings and s someone comes in and it's not, it's not um, charged up for whatever reason, um, and goes off, that's going to that could be a deck cause issue, so you've got, you've got power issues there, I can always see that straight away. And also when you go up, if, if we're going to carry on using the view for a bit, or wherever we meet, that could, again, that could be issues with um, power supplies. I think that's quite a legitimate one, or quite a big one in a lot of ways. Um, also, I think there'll be times when, uh, like, like some of the planning ones, you may want a few bits printed off. Some of the plans can be a bit more easier. Uh, or, or, or some of the big developments, possibly, or, or when you need a, some, any of this for council occasionally, you may want to demonstrate something with, with an A3 occasionally. I mean, so in practice, if it's thought out a bit more, I've got, I've got no, no objections to it. Okay, thank you very much for that contribution there and those practical points which you've raised, Councillor Honeyman. Mm. Uh, I'm going to go to this side, then I'll come back to this side of the room, and I can't, couldn't see who was first, but uh, you decided to sell. <laughs> 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 Let's go, Councillor Matthews, Councillor Duas, and Councillor Taylor, if that's okay. Um, I want to speak up for myself really was that I love having printouts so um, I just find them easier because I spend you know, well my job I shouldn't spend all day on a computer but I, sometimes I spend more time on a computer than I need to and sometimes when I come back in the evening actually last thing I want to do is switch on my laptop and read council papers it's um, I'd much rather flip through and make those scribble notes on, on paper copies mm -hmm. um, I do, I'm in favour of like reducing paper, um, but also with Councillor Meek and, um, um, I, yeah, I don't need another computer, I don't feel, I'm quite happy with it. And also that has, you know, that uses resources that, um, the world's resources anyway, doesn't it, as well, so in terms of lithium batteries and things. So, um, yeah, so I think, yeah. I'm quite happy for paper now, we don't use very much of it. So. Okay, thank you very much. And then Councillor Dibbert? I've got lots to say on this. Um, as you know, I, I led on the Bradford Council print strategy and we saved millions of pounds. Um, so I was a bit surprised when this paper came forward was to save 200 pounds on council papers. Um, there are so many things you could include on this and you haven't done. You haven't made a case for changing um, over to digital. Um, you need to consider things like, we've already had councillor surveys to say, do you want paper or digital? 
and they've already bought it with that, to get them to change their mind, you've got to come up with more than £200. You've got to come up with all the things that it is going to save money on, the toner, the machines, the lifespan of the machines. I'll do your list. Um, things like, uh, you've not included printing for other things. You've just focused on council papers. There's so many savings you can do. I'll just do a quick exercise. Um, on, on this particular document and you can do things on that by changing the print settings so things like aerial 12 narrow margins making all these paragraphs fit to the left margin three points on paragraph return single line spacing and if you did that you'd reduce this document from 34 to 21 pages and that is just a simple thing you can do that doesn't cost the council anything and you can implement that tomorrow. That's saving a third of your budget already if it's just these papers that you're talking about. Okay, thanks. No points, Councillor Devas. I think um, sort of summarising there, you know, this, this is an early stage proposal to work something up and maybe there's thought rather than, uh, you know, um, for future um, ways that we might go about this. Um, I'll pass on now to Councillor Taylor. I'll be very brief. Um, I, I welcome this. It's going to give me the push I need to stop printing. And um, on the question of uh, devices, um, I'm a bit concerned myself. Sorry, I'm looking at you, Councillor Meek, because you don't you want to continue to use your laptop. I have a laptop. Um, I, uh, I think the whole security issue is getting much more complicated. I used to work in an organisation where that was taken care of, you know, by the university, by what we all had to do. But it, it's not like that here. <laughs> well, maybe it is, or maybe it could be. But, you know, we don't have the same um, support structure, the same infrastructure, nothing like. So I'm less confident than you are about uh, Councillor Meek about, about you know being continuing to use my own laptop. Quite attracted to the idea of having my own device, which is my, my own. It's a council device that would be given to me as my councillor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anybody else with a fresh point before Councillor Meek? I've got a fresh um, point. I've got a fresh point. <laughs> makes his defence. <laughs> Okay, yes, go for it, and then I'll make mine. Um, I just wanted to, uh, three things. I should have said at the beginning, I, I applaud this initiative, and thank you for taking it, because we didn't ask you for it. Uh, but this is the Climate Change Committee, and we are supposed to come up with the ideas, maybe, uh, for officers. But the officers have come up with the ideas, so I think that's fantastic. But in answer to Councillor Dubas, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, this could be reformatted, and that's absolutely fine. I think you'll find that it, I thought I did read somewhere in the report about things like printer ink, and uh, uh, you know, a pollution of waterways with uh, washing paper product and all that kind of stuff. I, Fred, I, I don't agree with your assertion that it's to do with money. It's nothing to do with money. This is the Climate Change Committee. It's not to do with money at all. It's to do with the environment and wasting paper and uh, ink and toners and all, as you, as you quite rightly said. That's what I feel. Um, I, and I take up with your point about security. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say, I don't have a very good kind of firewall thing because I just get a free one. But if we did do this and people were using their own computers, I wonder if the council should pay for people to have a proper firewall thing which was monitored in some way. Uh, because I don't, and I maybe should pay for it because these are, I do at some points have exempt papers on here, which admittedly I then delete, but probably for a week or two I have exempt papers on here. So yes, I wonder if we could pay for councillors. If you don't have a computer, maybe the council can pay for the IT backup that would pay for a good firewall and the hacking security and that, whatever that might be. Coming back to you, in London I had my briefcase, you know, stolen out of my car, which could have had papers in it. I can't remember if they did. But if they had physical papers in, that's where they can be stolen as well, if they're an exempt thing. Maybe you shouldn't take them out of the house, but you walk home with them, you could be mugged. I mean, you know, <laughs> you can't have absolute security. But I do take your point, Councillor Taylor. That's a very valid point. But hence my suggesting. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Taylor, 
Thank you. So there are various <coughs> different options. Yes, absolutely. So th through the chair, I mean, I'm aware that the question in terms of double hatting councillors and whether or not you would need to have two different laptops, I think it's something we, we, mm. we can look into. I'm aware of instances in the past where some councillors who are double or triple hatters have been allowed to use the same laptop for all three councils. I don't know if that's an official policy or whether that's just been permitted, but it's certainly something that we can look into and find out if that's feasible. Um, one would hope that if for example, Lewis District Council were the other council, they would have put the sufficient firewalls in place, so therefore we wouldn't need to duplicate that on another laptop. Sure. But I don't know if that would then work with some councillors who aren't double hatters, hatted, having one, having a laptop from Seaford and, and those that were from Lewis having a different one. And obviously we've got another councillor who's from East Sussex as well, and they might have another one. So I think we'd need to investigate whether that's possible. Um, but it's certainly something we can look into. Um, <coughs> the other thing I'll say about the security is, of course, if the computer is locked with a, a proper password, then even if they do steal the computer, they shouldn't be able to access the files, whereas that's not the case with paper. True. True. Thank you very much for those really important points. Can I just add yes, point just following on from what um, Town Clark has said, is that, you know, what I'm hearing as well, it's about confidence, and I think if we look at this as the wider strategy then it, it could be the outcome could be that we look into things that we can do to make councillors more confident in not needing printed papers so that it might not be that we're talking about buying all devices for all councillors it might be that we have um funds available for if a councillor doesn't have a suitable device so it's definitely something that we can look into yeah, thanks for being flexible with the options that's really great uh councillor buchanan you can uh, jump in front of me oh sorry please. no 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 you really, really good, yeah. Uh, pretty much in support of uh, uh, Councillor Matthews' thoughts there, I am afraid to say that I'm a paper kind of guy. This is all the time I've spent as an engineer. I always found that reading a spec and marking it up, or looking at a drawing and marking it up, and it's available. Was always, when all this CAD stuff came in, the kids in the office, the younger, I mean, they, they, they weren't brought up on drawing boards. They used to use the CAD stuff, and then they read it on a. You can only ever see that part of the drawing on a screen, and then it would go and get in stores somewhere, and they would probably never look at that drawing ever again. They didn't have the quality of understanding of the project because yeah. they weren't. They, they were they were digital. So I'm afraid it's going to have to be a two-tier system <laughs> as a minimum for digitally excluded. Elderly chairs. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Right. Um, if I may, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if, point. if there's an option to get um, the, the screens where you can write on. Would that be? Into that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would that satisfy digitally? So. Are you talking to me? Okay. Well, I think. <laughs> from, I'll pick that up if you like in my point and then um, see. So, um, so we've heard a variety of different user experiences and opinions and obviously it would uh, be great to use less paper if we can, partly for cost but largely for environmental and all the toner and the water and all that kind of stuff. Um, that said, um, I think there is merit in looking at this but I agree that we could look at it a bit wider. And I'll just make a few um, observations. So when we had the uh, climate change course, that I forget the exact title of, uh, that Community Energy South delivered, very embarrassingly, I hope they're not watching this. Carbon literacy. Carbon literacy, that's the one. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> um, I was very struck by the difference between how much carbon equivalent is taken up by attaching a document to an email versus storing it centrally on a cloud for people to access. And you know, it may not be very much per email, but for someone like me or whoever, sends a lot of emails and it, it, it adds up. So I wonder if you know we could expand this slightly to look not just at sort of our paper for counsellors, but um, the sort of pa paper and email comms a little bit more widely perhaps um, in the future. Um, obviously there's, there are points made and we're, we're here at Climate Change about the embodied carbon and materials in the machines and there's nothing 
that doesn't have an environmental impact, as we all know about electric vehicles. Um, but, um, you know, I, I have a laptop which was issued by LDC. They uh, have been generous and allowed me to put the STC stuff on. It works mostly quite well, but obviously with that, you've got two Microsoft Office logins. And I can only really do it when I'm running one off the browser and one off the desktop. I can't do it any other way because they get really confused and kick you out and you have to sign in six million times and it's a pain. Um, so yeah, perhaps we need to look at sort of a life cycle assessment of, of the supply and, and materials and so on. I mean, we don't want to make, make this a too much an onerous task. Again, you know, if we're making relative savings and relative improvements in environmental stuff, I think that's a positive, you know, we don't need to go into sort of academic detail too much about how much it is, but just bearing those things uh, in mind, we've got some, some practical things. I mean, you know, I brought my laptop with me tonight. I don't often use it in a meeting. My reasons are I find it difficult for my eyes to focus on that and then focus on the room, particularly if I'm chairing because my eyes will start going blurry. Um, so, you know, everyone's got these sort of quirks and things. Um, and also when I'm scribbling stuff down, as, as Councillor Dubas said, you know, I, this laptop you can't write on. I did meet someone who had a fantastic device that I can't remember the name of that looked like a sort of Kindle thing, but you could scribble on it and it was really, it was almost like having paper on a, on a tablet. And, you know, perhaps for me personally, that's something I would go for and perhaps others would. Um, but yeah, sort of having some options there and actually maybe, I mean, I don't want to, obviously I've got a double hat, so I don't want to speak for Lewis District Council, but other, you know, councils are looking at how they can perhaps work together and make savings across the board. Perhaps we are we might ask another provider to provide stuff for us, and therefore it's all embodied in the same embedded in the same systems. Um, you know, sort of getting more of a streamline together. I don't know whether that's possible, but um, I like the idea of investigating this a bit further and working up a report um, to see you know where we could go with this. Um, so I'm going to allow Councillor Matthews to come in before I ask for some proposals. Um, <coughs> I'll start off for a moment actually. So start just one word. So I just think might make a difference, but to approve future steps proposed by officers to bring a comprehensive print and paper reduction strategy proposal. So therefore that sets out the intentions in terms of we want to reduce what we what we're using here. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if that includes my suggestion of the print settings, which immediately reduces paper output by a third. And it's and also it. transmissible, so you can look like you've already yeah. measured it, so then next year you can go, well, we've, we've made the recommendations that so I think that's, that's all. Sorry. And Could then we can see whether yeah. we're actually, up, we can measure it year on year. Yeah, something that's measurable would be great ultimately, yes. even if it's just relative to itself. Um, I think, you know, we do need to look at these kind of things in the round. Obviously we're here looking primarily through sort of climate change environmental eyes we've also had sort of financial considerations but you know we've got you know people who have personal preferences for whatever reason whether it's habit or health or whatever it is like you know i know you've got to there's certain things about laying out a page that it doesn't have too much blocky text because actually it can then become difficult to read uh you know for people with particular impairments perhaps and so on a bit like um, using certain colours is more favourable. So there are other things in terms of accessibility and sort of usability aren't there to consider. So we, we've got to take a holistic view of course uh, on this but Councillor Honeyman you wanted to make a point. Probably following on what you're saying and what Councillor DeBus was saying but if you could look back on some older council papers, used to use used to times at the moment, this is there, there's the or is it something else even than something else Same, again? Yeah. But it was also it was also five eleven as opposed to twelve. So this is twelve now, isn't it? Could, so you've got to be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. So we're... I just want to say so the reports were updated a few years ago now, um, and it was on the advice that they are and, and all of the margins that we have in the line spacing yeah. was on the advice of I think Access CIFA to make them as accessible as possible for people to read. Um, because obviously they're not just for councillors, it's for the public as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. as uh, Councillor Bristow said, not saying we're not going to look into it, but just saying it will, need, it will be as part of the full considerations that we can look at where we can make reductions. Um, it might be that that was the advice three years ago, but it might be that the advice has changed because um, people with visual impairments have different ways of, of viewing things. So. Things move on, don't they? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please. Oh, yes. I just want to come back on your um, points there. 
that if you've got a digital copy, you can change that to 16 point, 24 point. You can have one letter per screen. I've worked with visually impaired uh, people um, on my team, and I, I know that that is possible. But we have a standard that we put forward, and that's a printing standard. <coughs> if you want to change that for your own view, have it in red, have it in 20 point, have it in Times New Roman. You can change it to whatever you want, okay. but we have a standard for printing. This is for printing. It's saving money on that, saving on paper, toner, etc. Yeah. Et yeah. et so yeah, so there's flexibility in the digital stuff, mm -hmm. but also perhaps utilising that to save on this. Thank you very much. Right, um, town, in from town clock. Yeah, through this, yeah, the other, the other consideration is in terms of financially um, excluded councillors as well in that we can't automatically assume that every councillor can afford to provide their own IT equipment mm. um, because we don't want to exclude anyone from being able to take part as a councillor and so to assume that every councillor can provide their own laptop is not something which yeah. arguably we should yeah. be Brilliant. 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 Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, right, I think given that we're after quarter past nine, unless anyone's got any very burning points, I'll bring this together now. Um, so thanks for the discussion on that, um, hopefully that's given some brilliant food for thought. And I'll move to the recommendations. So we've got the first recommendation to note the contents of the report. May I have a proposal? Uh, Councillor Meek, I think you were a split second before Councillor Buchanan, who I'll take to second. And uh, if I, yes, is that okay? Um, and uh, please may I have a show of hands for those in favour of this? Recommendation. That's all, all present councillors, thank you. We have an amendment on the table for um, recommendation. <coughs> yes. So to confirm the amendment recommendation is to approve future steps proposed by officers to bring a comprehensive print and paper reduction strategy proposal to full council for their consideration. Right, so I'll take a proposal for that as Councillor Matthews, as it was your suggestion. A second of the amendment, Councillor Dubas, all in favour of the amendment. That's everybody. And now we'll vote on the actual amended motion. Can read it again? Or <coughs> I think we're okay, we've just inserted the word reduction there. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, can I have a proposal for recommendation two, please? Councillor Matthews again, and a seconder. Councillor Dubas, and all in favour, please show your hands. That's again everybody, so no abstentions or anybody against. Thank you very much. Right, I will conclude the meeting at 9.20pm. Thanks everybody for coming and contributing and all the officers' support, uh, including you, Simon, for coming along.